Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about dimensional analysis while using the metric system in scientific notation. So I'm going to give you some background here. But first I want to ask some questions of you. How many yards are in a mile? How many perches are in an acre? Why are there 16 ounces to the imperial pound and 2240 pounds to the imperial ton? The answer is, who cares? It literally does not matter. In other words, the imperial system that the U.S. has inherited historically is so ridiculous and dumb compared to the metric system that it literally does not matter. It is a waste of time to try to memorize how many ounces are in a whatever. It just does not matter. So we're going to be talking about the metric system as part of the lesson for today. And there are multiple reasons why the metric system is superior. I'll just mention the first one, it's base 10. So instead of trying to remember there are 16 fluid ounces in a whatever, it's all base 10 with the metric system. And so let's go ahead and start using the metric system scientific notation and incorporating those ideas into dimensional analysis problems. All right, so first you're going to need to know what the standard units of the metric system are. And so if you're in a science class, like a physics, chemistry, or some other science class, our standard units we're going to be dealing with with length are going to be meters. You've probably seen a meter stick at some point of your life. And for mass, it's going to be a gram. A gram is about equivalent to one paperclip. And a volume measurement that we need to deal with is a liter. So you've probably seen a two liter bottle before. And for time, we'll use a base unit of seconds. Okay, and so it's important to know what those base or standard units are because they're going to be useful as stepping stones to start from a given part of a problem to an ending part of the problem. You're going to want to convert from, say, a smaller unit than the standard unit to a larger unit. You're going to use that standard unit in the middle. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If the problem were to give you, say, millimeters and want you to convert into kilometers, what you would do is take millimeters, convert into meters, and then from meters, convert into kilometers. So that's how it's going to be kind of a stepping stone here. You could go that direction. You can also go in the opposite direction. And if you happen to know the prefixes that go into this, I'll use kilo as an example. If you know that kilo means 1,000, when you say a kilometer or a kilometer, that literally means 1,000 meters. So my question that I would pose to you is what do you think a kiloliter would mean? Well, of course it would mean a thousand liters. It's so easy and straightforward to use the metric system that of course, if you know the prefix meaning, you can apply it to different standard or base units and it means literally the same thing. Milli, as an example, means one one thousandth or you could say there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter for an example. So if there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter, then you could also say there are 1,000 milligrams in one gram, or a milligram is one one-thousandth of a gram. So that's one reason why the metric system is so useful. You use these base units and you use prefixes, attach the prefixes onto the base units, and the prefixes all mean the same thing, even with different bases. But again, I want to emphasize this key strategy here. You're going to use these base units as sort of stepping stones to get from where you started from to where you want to go. Next up, we're going to talk about scientific notation. You may have had this before, so I'm going to do this as a quick review. Scientific notation is actually really useful to write large or small numbers accurately and more easily than writing out many, many numbers and many, many digits or typing out many, many zeros into a calculator. If you know what you're doing, you can use this in a calculator and it makes life a lot easier. So let's start with these examples on the left-hand side. So if we start with an example number of 3450, 3450, there's actually an implied decimal place right here. You don't see it, but it's implied that it's there. If we were gonna convert that to scientific notation, we're effectively gonna have to multiply it by a number that will move it over three spots, one, two, three, because the standard form for scientific notation is one digit and then the decimal place and then however many digits you have in terms of significant figures left over here times some base 10 to some power. So that's the standard format for scientific notation. So this would be the answer here. 3.45 times 10 to the third would be representing this example number in scientific notation. And again, we've moved the decimal place over to the left three times. I don't want you to memorize that. I do want you to notice the pattern, though. If you take a look at this example, so I set these up so you can compare and contrast these. 34.5, to put this in the scientific notation, 
we just want to move this decimal place over by 1. And if we do that, it's like saying 3.45 times 10 to the 1 power will be this number in scientific notation. And take a look at these examples down here. Now I want to do the slightly tougher version. We're going to do essentially the opposite. If we have a smaller number over here, something that is less than 1, you can have your decimal place right here. But we want to get the decimal place moved over 1, 2, 3 places right there. Because we want 3.45 as our standard base for the scientific notation times 10 to the something. Well, in this case, if you're going to move the decimal place to the right, it's going to be times 10 to the negative 3. Negative 3 because it is 3 places over that we've moved that decimal place. So those are the basics of working in scientific notation. If you have trouble with this, please take a moment to look at these examples and study them closely. Okay, next up there are some common metric prefixes you should become familiar with. And you'll see in a physics classroom or in a chemistry classroom or some other related class, you'll see most of these, if not all of them and maybe some others as well. So pico, nano, micro, milli, centi, kilo, and mega are these prefixes you should learn. These are the scientific notation values. This is essentially what these things mean in scientific notation. I will say at the outset, this letter right here we don't have in our alphabet, it's pronounced mu, but you would call it like micro, like micrometers means 10 to the negative six meters. I want to say don't be intimidated if you ever see a Greek letter in a science classroom. It just is a letter that's outside of our alphabet. So just don't let it bother you. It's just another way of writing something, you could say. All right, so if we wanted to read this table, you could say, so if we're looking at kilo, for instance, right here, you could say one kilogram is equal to 10 to the three grams, or you could write this not using scientific notation and say one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. That's one way of reading this table right here. And a tougher way of thinking this through is if we look at the milli designation. So what this means is one milli something, like one milliliter, that should be a capital L, one milliliter is equal to 10 to the negative three liters. Now if we wanted to change that into a slightly more readable form, if I got rid of the 10 to the 3 and multiply both sides by 10 to the 3, so to speak, or both sides by 1,000, what that would do is give me 1 liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. I actually think this is an easier way to understand what we mean by a milliliter. I know what a liter is, and I can say in comparison to one liter, it would take 1,000 milliliters to fill up one liter. So that must mean, therefore, that a milli is a smaller unit than a base unit of liter, right? So it would take 1,000 of them to fill up a one liter bottle. As a teacher, I tend to avoid memorization as much as possible, but I would suggest these four in here are things you would probably want to memorize for a physics or chemistry classroom. Not that memorization is a great thing, but just that you'll see them so often that it will help if you have them memorized. All right, and so let's try some problems here. So we could say 1.2 kilograms is equal to how many grams? So we're gonna start and make this as easy as possible so that you can see the concepts and understand what's going on. You start with your given. By the way, if you have not had any training in dimensional analysis, I have done a screencast on some of the basics of dimensional analysis. I'll put a link in the upper right right now. So take a look at that if you need to. But we're going to multiply by a fraction that is equivalent to 1. That will be able to cancel out our kilograms and convert into grams. And if we do that, we end up with these numbers over here. I do want to point out that one good thing about scientific notation is I think it's easier to note how many sig figs you have. Here it's clear we have two sig figs that we're dealing with. And so in my mind, it's actually easier to work with scientific notation than numbers, especially when you have a lot of zeros to count. It's easy to miscount your zeros and get the problem wrong. All right, so now let's take this one step further. So if we had 1.2 kilograms, how many milligrams is that gonna be equal to? So we're gonna start just like we did before, and we're gonna add one more in this chain of conversions that we're doing. We need to convert out of grams, so grams need to be on the bottom over here, and convert into milligrams, and so we continue with this, and we end up with this as our answer. And just a conceptual reminder of what we talked about earlier, you're gonna use grams as your stepping stone to go from milligrams into kilograms, or in this case, from kilograms over into milligrams. So it's a two-step process, right? So from kilograms to grams, and then grams to milligrams. I highly recommend that you do not skip 
from kilograms over to milligrams. Yes, that will save you one step in terms of your calculation, but even if you're a smart student, it opens you up for making a silly mistake. All right, and so let's take a look at another problem here. So 3.45 micrograms is equal to how many grams? So we would just write our given down and think about that table I showed you. There are a couple different ways to write this, so I'm going to show you two different ways. Straight off of the table, it would say 1 microgram is 10 to the 6 grams. You can do it this way, or you could write it like this. You could say 3.45 micrograms is equal to 1 over 10 to the 6 micrograms. So you see what I'm doing here. This still shows that a microgram is a very small amount. In fact, there are a million micrograms in one gram. That's what this is saying. 10 to the 6 is 1 million. So you do the math, and you actually come out with the same answer. Either way you set this up is going to be fine. Either way, it's easier for you to understand this. Go for it and do the problem. All right, the last thing I want to point out is at the outset, this is probably towards the beginning of your school year and your course, I do want to stress when you work this in a calculator, anytime you have something in scientific notation, please use parentheses. So in this case, um, if we had something else like 5.55 times 10 to the negative 6, I would put that whole thing inside parentheses and do something similar over here inside parentheses. If you get in the habit of doing that, you will avoid an order of operation errors that will throw off your problem down the line, so to speak. And so this concludes the lesson. Hopefully it's been helpful. Let me know if you have any comments. And I'm going to continue and talk to you about the hardest type of dimensional analysis problem that you can do, typically which are rate problems. And so I'll go over rate problems next. There should be a link to that, and that video should start soon. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.